Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone from wherever you're joining us from. Welcome to the next instantiation of TinyML Talks. My name is Ravi Sivalingam and I'm from Qualcomm AI Research. Today, we're going to have Peter Ng from Edge Impulse give a talk about an introduction to TinyML for all backgrounds with a hands-on introduction to Edge Impulse. This is the introductory uh, opening um, session for the new TinyML meetup group in Cape Town, South Africa. And we have over 700 members in the TinyML meetup groups across Africa. We'd like to thank all our TinyML talk sponsors and strategic partners who helped us make this possible. Uh, additional sponsorships are available. Please contact olga at tinyml.org for more info. This is an announcement for a big upcoming event. Our TinyML Asia Summit is live online on November 2nd to November 5th, 2021. Uh, please register today if you go to the link or use the QR code on the screen. And thank you to all our sponsors and strategic partners who enabled this event. The TinyML Vision Challenge uh, just concluded last week and the winners will be announced actually on October 5th. And uh, please uh, look out for the winner announcements and the upcoming winners panel event. Our next TinyML talk on Tuesday, September 28th is by Marios Fernarakis from Qualcomm Technologies in Netherlands on a practical guide to neural network quantization, same time on Tuesday. All right, Peter Ng is from Cape Town and sees all technology and science to continue. We had to select one discipline and chose to complete an end up in electrical engineering. He has tinkered in many different areas and has worked formerly in the retail, transport, and automotive sectors, integrating different systems and technologies together. His work interests and experience include embedded systems, industrial automation, IoT, and software development, and more recently, machine learning, which is what makes TinyML the ideal landing point. Take it away, Peter. Thank you, everybody. Um, yes, so yeah, for myself, uh, more recently, tiny ML, um, machine learning has become an uh, interest. And one of the things you find when you get into uh, trying to get into machine learning or deep learning is you typically face with a scenario where you're not really sure where to start. There's, there are a lot of options, a lot of pathways, a lot of approaches to learning the subject matter. And um, for this for purpose of this talk, what I want to do is I want to try and just go through the overview of the basic concepts um, and outline some of the general ideas and thought patterns that you kind of need to uh, instill in your mind when dealing with this field and as you go into it. So, yeah. So don't feel disheartened if you're trying to get out uh, into this and you and you and you don't know where to go, or where to start. You're reading different blogs, you're reading different uh, books, and it just doesn't seem like you're getting anywhere. Um, once you start to see the, the 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 landscape for what it's made up of, it starts to all fit together. So I hope I can help in that journey in some way. I'm not an expert in this. I'm learning as well as I go along. So yes, and thank you for the opportunity. So let's get into it. So starting off with artificial intelligence. Um, this is a word that's quite loaded. Uh, to different people, it means different things, but most people, they picture things like robots, science fiction, things like that. They, pick, they picture machines that can do things and, and, and take over the world. The truth of the matter is artificial intelligence is uh, not necessarily there yet, but it's getting there at some point. But um, it's all about making computers um, behave like they are thinking, like, like they are people. And it started off in the 1950s um, at Dartmouth College. Uh, some of the big names like Minsky, Turing, they, they, they spoke about the uh, concepts and ideas and they started to formalize this into an actual discipline. Um, it continued in the 60s and 70s. Unfortunately, uh, it was what known as the AI winter. That was when research came to a halt, funding stopped, mostly because of lack of um, confidence in, in, in some of the techniques, as well as the computational technology at the time was nowhere near what it is today to allow proper experimentation with neural networks. So it went through a quiet period, but behind the scenes, people continued experimenting, continued doing things, and a lot of the work in statistics um, ended up uh, forming into uh, computational techniques, into machine learning, which is where you get your classical machine learning that, that sort of appeared. And it wasn't really thought of by a lot of people as artificial intelligence. It was, it was just sort of like computational statistics until people started to identify it as a form of machine learning. In the 2000s, we saw a revival. Um, neural networks, um, people started looking at it again. 
And what's happened in the last decade in particular, we've seen an explosion in Moore's Law. We've seen um, silicon come down in price, capabilities go up. Um, we've seen uh, manufacturing, nanometer technology scale manufacturing, allow high levels of integration, such that we now have uh, chips and components that can do things like, calculate, like perform neural network inference much more um, practically and efficiently than it could be done 15 years ago. But I'm sure most people are familiar with the fact that um, a cell phone is more powerful than a 486 computer was back in 2008. So we, we've come a long way. Uh, the same with embedded systems and electronics. 15 years ago, 10 years ago, building something with Wi-Fi built in was quite a challenge and if not impossible for the average tinker at home. Today, it's commonplace to see people building all kinds of interesting things at home. For under $10, $20, you can build something quite amazing nowadays. So that was technology that in the old days was military-grade technology or highly expensive things. We now have what's known as the AI Spring, where we're seeing a lot of uh, leap uh, frogging of, 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 of knowledge and snowballing effect where things are getting better and better and we're learning more and more and we're building upon each other's knowledge. And this is where Tiny ML has also came up and, and appeared in, in this landscape. Just looking at AI, narrow AI is probably uh, a better term for what we currently call AI. Um, the other form of AI, which people tend to think of when they think of AI is artificial general intelligence. So what researchers have said, narrow AI is when computers appear to demonstrate thinking capabilities, but aren't really conscious. Whereas artificial general intelligence is when a machine starts to become sentient, starts to become its own being with consciousness, and that, that, that's, that's the next level. Well, now, um, I know AI you can classify into reactive machines, so they don't remember anything. Reactive machines just evaluate inputs and produce outputs. Um, uh, the limited memory is probably what's more um, well-known now, like uh, well, computer vision uh, type algorithms, where it has ability to, to remember previous inputs and learn from them and produce uh, outputs on, 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 on other data that hasn't seen before. So yeah, so we, we, we're finding that a lot of the focus right now is in this limited memory area. Artificial intelligence, general intelligence, however, speaks to theory of mind, which would be the first level of this new wave of AI when it happens. Uh, that's the ability for a machine to understand human emotions and, and understand the individual person. So we actually kind of, some of, some of the, the AI we have is kind of close to that now where it can sort of learn, it seems to learn, but it hasn't really got to a point where it truly understands two different people and the specific um, uh, personalities, like there's a movie called Her. Um, that could potentially be an example of theory of mind where, where the, the protagonist falls in love with an actual um, bot that's able to understand him specifically. So we're still quite a way away from that. And then of course, self-awareness is the ultimate. Uh, this is where you have things like um, your robots, your terminators, those kind of things where the machine can think for itself and be conscious. So there's obviously a lot of debate from philosophical debates about this in terms of what this means for mankind and you know the dangers of it. So, and then from the these machines could, in theory, uh, engineer more intelligent systems that are beyond even the human mind. So, and that's of course where things start to get very concerning. But we're a long way from that point yet, and there's a lot we can do with narrow AI. So, some of it called weak AI, but narrow AI is maybe a better term. Um, yeah. So, that's just to give some background. Then when you're coming into AI, that's, a, that's the AI from sort of like a broad view. When you go in more closely, you obviously see machine learning and deep learning coming up as topics. And for a new person, it can be a bit confusing as to AI, machine learning, deep learning, where does it all fit in? So essentially AI or artificial intelligence is the broad category. It includes some of the old techniques like expert systems, fuzzy logic, um, things that aren't maybe used as much as they were before. Um, it's a general and machine learning is a subcategory of that. So machine learning would be, like I mentioned earlier, the statistical techniques that have been converted into computational um, algorithms that can be used to understand data and, and, and make predictions of data. Deep learning would then be a subset of machine learning, uh, specifically supervised learning, which we'll touch on soon, um, which is gives a lot more power to that technique than just plain classical machine learning. So looking at artificial intelligence, like I mentioned, there were some fuzzy logic, expert system, symbolic. That was some of the techniques that were explored and are still used out there. Um, that's the one wing. But where we're seeing a large uh, practical usage and interest in resurgence in the last few years is in machine learning and of course deep learning. 
So machine learning is can be categorized into supervised learning. Um, supervised learning is when you train it against a known uh, data set and it learns to understand what you expect from a data set and then it must be able to generalize on unseen data and be able to make predictions. So in other words, if you show pictures of cats and dogs and tell it this is a cat, this is a dog, over and over and over again, if it sees a new breed of cat, it should in theory be able to generalize. That, that, that's how it works. There are two types of general categories of supervised learning. One is uh, regression uh, and the other one is classification. So regression, some people just say it's outputting a number. So it's basically saying a prediction like what would the stock market, uh, what would the value of the dollar be against the pound in on such and such a day? It outputs a single number. Classification is where you classify the output into probabilities of being in different classes. For example, cat or dog. That's an example. Is this picture a cat or dog? Or is it a human? Is it an adult? Is it a child? You can, you, you, this is where we find a lot of um, applications and utility technology. It's used all around us. Um, almost everybody is using it in some form on their phones without realizing it. So yes, that's deep learning is the next level of um, supervised learning where instead of using um, like regression and, and, and statistical type calculations, we actually use neural networks, which are very interesting uh, computational algorithms that are able to learn on their own and through training and, and provide us with a way to actually uh, do a lot more than what we could do with traditional classical uh, machine learning. Um, you'll see things like perceptrons, the basic perceptrons, the building blocks, uh, convolutional neural networks use a lot in computer vision, recurrent neural networks, uh, with feedback and have storage in them. Uh, these kind of things, uh, you know, like they can you can go quite deep into them. So again, the, when you're coming into the field and you just sort of landing on a page somewhere and you're coming across one of these things, it can sort of seem a bit overwhelming because you're not really sure where you stand. But if you start to see that fits together and you break it down to a hierarchy, then it all kind of comes together. Unsupervised learning is another technique which isn't as widely hyped by many, but it's quite, it's, it's used a lot. It's used to look for patterns in data. Um, so essentially what you can do is you can do dimensionality reduction. So that means you take a lot of data, it's got a lot of information, a lot of features in it, and you compress it. So you take out the specific things that make sense to what you're looking for. Um, that's used a lot in pre-processing in, in, in actually supervised learning, actually take the data and actually extract features and, and, and make it a lot more efficient uh, for uh, training and, and inference purposes. Clustering is again, looking for patterns in data. So that would be when you typically look for, uh, like you could look for fraud, for example, you could look at patterns of credit card transactions and through clustering, you actually find things happen. So clustering, you don't train it, it just looks at the existing data as is. Anomaly detection is another example. You could look for, for potential outliers in the data where things are not fitting into the standard uh, uh, like distribution and you could then from there pick up things. So this is a very really useful technique for trying to understand data, understand what's going on. It's not necessarily something that will generalize on new data like supervised learning. The last uh, general category of machine learning is reinforcement learning. So this is pretty much how we learn as children or how our animal would learn. You start off with when you step on a nail, you get sore. You put your foot in a hot bath, and that's uh, and you learn from that not to do that again. So that's what reinforcement learning is about. You have an actor or an agent, and it learns from the environment through positive and negative rewards. It learns which behaviors to optimize. So um, a good example of experimenting with this, if you've got access to AWS, uh, they've got um, uh, like a back end where you can do the, 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 the deep deep lead, I think it is where you can practice a self-driving car. And that works on reinforcement learning where it actually learns to stay in the center of the lane through learning what not, not to reward itself when it goes off the lane. So this is the, these things are obviously combined together as well to give uh, more, more advanced things like self-driving cars. Um, just going further, um, displaying intelligence. So as human beings, as people, even, even as children, uh, we learn as we grow up. So things we can do, we can display intelligence by, we can detect almost every, everybody from the age of a few weeks is able to detect people. Uh, as we get, become adults, we can actually identify people in the scene. So you, you're all familiar with us. You know, these, are, these are things we take for granted. We can recognize spoken words. We know what danger is. We learn to understand what to avoid nature and in our environment. We recognize when something's about to fail. So if you've got a car and you're driving, quite easily, uh, a lot of people are able to tell 
when something isn't right. You know, you've got that feeling, you just know something doesn't sound right or something at home, an appliance isn't overheating or something. So we, we, we listen to sounds, we look at visual cues, we look at temperature changes. And these are all things that we start to build in our minds without even thinking about it. We build this understanding of the environment around us and the so-called intelligence where we're able to react to variation, something a computer traditionally can't do. So if you look at, um, we use our senses for that. If you look at a child, the child starts out with input from the environment, uh, you build connections in the neurons in the brain and your abilities grow. As you do this more and more and more and you crawl around and you scratch the cupboards and do all kinds of things, your, 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 your experience increases, you take more inputs, your, your, your connections between your neurons and the synapses, they get, they get more intense, they, they, they become denser, they become more complex uh, and you start to build more and more and start to learn more and more things. You go to school, you learn knowledge, that's supervised learning. You're taking a textbook, you're reading something and you're teaching it to yourself and you learn it again uh, and so on and so forth. It goes on. So that's typically how we, we learn. We learn an isolated process through uh, interacting with our environment. We would arguably combine some reinforcement learning together with supervised learning. And you know, once, you, once you get older, you can do all these cool things and you have all these skills. So that's what we want machines to do. We want to take machines and programs and get them to be able to do that. So that's where machine learning comes in, programs that can learn. So if anybody's done any software development or any form of coding, whether it be on PC, data uh, systems, Arduinos, you know you pretty much got to think about the problem. You've got to come up with an algorithm or a set of steps to solve the problem. And then you've typically got to write the code as rules. So you do if-then statements and you have loops. Um, in such a program, they talk about sequence selection, iteration. You can pretty much solve any problem with that approach in terms of writing code. The problem is when you have variability in your environment, like things you haven't seen before, the code fails. Because you, 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 you could eventually start coding in as many if-then statements as required, but eventually get to a point where if you try to cater for every single example of every kind of scenario you haven't seen before, it will soon become extremely complicated, but impossible. And that's typically where programs come to an end and come to limitations. There are obviously the things like control systems in aircraft, if they use stability and feedback maths to actually try and optimize. But again, it's within a set of constrained parameters that have to be modeled up front. The whole thing has to be modeled up front before you actually do it. Uh, machine learning is where you look at saying, you know what, we haven't modeled anything up front. We've trained something. We want to try and get the program to actually figure out what's going on on things that it's never seen or hasn't been modeled in before. So typically, all programs take inputs, um, perform some kind of logic, and produce outputs. In the machine and learning, learning world, we refer to the program as a model. And there are two general, um, in machine learning, and this is what <clears throat> a lot of people also don't get sometimes in the beginning. Uh, for me, this also was what I call the aha moment where I actually saw, understood what was going on, was the difference between learning and uh, inference. But anyway, coming back to learning, learning, we, 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 what we do is we train the model and you give it inputs. So you show it examples of, of something it hasn't seen before. And internally, the machine learning algorithm adjusts the links inside the program, if you want to think of it like that. And it, it does it iteratively, and it changes these, 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 these infrastructure. So it could be weight values or parameters. Um, it does it over and over, uh, one complete iteration through an entire training set called Epoch. Uh, and it goes through this over and over again. And we are inside the code, if you want to think of it, you know, you know in, a, in a way of a code is almost like it's writing itself. It's not really code, but it has the same resultant effect as that instead of coding the program, you're generating the program using this training process. And you need a training data set for supervised learning and you need a test data set. So what you do is you be careful when you train, um, you mustn't uh, train too much on the same data set and without testing. And these things you must do like splitting your data up between training and, and testing sets so that you can validate and make sure that your model works. And you know, they're, 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 those are obviously out of scope of this session, but those are the things you will typically learn and play with uh, once you get into it. You'll learn how to not overfit models and what the terminology means. One term terminology, that piece of uh, jargon that, that most people look to is hyperparameters. So hyper hyperparameters in the model, when the model's being trained, you're actually adjusting the weights or the parameters of the model, which is the actual links between the, the steps of the algorithm inside the model. Uh, hyperparameters are actually parameters of the training algorithm. So you can think of it as like a pilot with a cockpit and switches and dials. Those are the levers and switches you work to operate 
the, 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 the machine that, that is doing the training. So one has to know um, how to do that and, and you, you start to learn from experience. So this is again why you have to practice and you'll see later on something like Edge Impulse will make it easier for you to do as well without having to worry about all the putting it together. Yeah, so overfitting would be when you typically, when you have, um, you train something too much on one piece of data. So it, 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 it becomes too good at understanding that specific set of data and can't generalize. So you could show dogs, for example, but you showed only three breeds of dogs and you train it with a lot of data and you, you train it too much and then it'll understand those dogs, but when you show it a new breed or a breed that it hasn't seen before, which it should be able to understand, can't generalize so well. So those are the kind of things you have to learn and the trade-offs you have to make. The other side of machine learning is inference. So where learning is the actual training and building of the model, inference is the execution and using of the model. So again, if you come from a programming point of view, um, you could think of it as uh, learning would be writing the function, writing the methods, and inference is actually using the, S the API and actually calling the, the, the function, actually running it. So um, again, it's passing the data in, unseen data in, and looking at the output uh, and expecting predictions or classification or regression coming out the output. So you're running the model. So that, that's a key distinction to make because a lot of times when you read documentation and AI, um, again, when you're fresh and new to this, you don't know what it means. So you see, like for me, when I first saw AI on the edge, I was a bit confused because I was like, what are they doing? Like, and then I started to realize and understand, actually it's a difference between training and inference. So, this is typically where you will branch off as well, and you could, you know, you could end up spending a lot of time on each one of these activities. Now, that's when we get to TinyML. So, TinyML, I'll introduce it now, is essentially inference on low power, you know, with small embedded devices. So, it's basically running a machine learning model, not on a big supercomputer or a machine with a graphics processor, but actually running it on a small little embedded device, which I'll show you an example of. You'll see a nice definition. It's a bit complex to read. But uh, when you wrap your head around it, it starts to make sense. It's Tom Mitchell's definition of machine learning. So I won't go into it too much, but it basically speaks to how with iterative experience uh, from training, it learns to perform a task better. So those are the kind of academic um, things you see that, that people mention. And it kind, of, it kind of complicates things, but just understand the basics and understand visually the concept and it makes a lot more sense. So just quickly going through it, Classical machine learning, that's linear regression. That's basically your linear equation from maths. Space and statistics, um, when you train it, you learn the parameters. So the values beta one and two are the, are the values that are adjusted as the learning algorithm runs. Whereas deep learning uses neural networks and neural networks, um, they work on a principle of inputs. So you'll see these nodes x1, x2, x3, and those then are weighted. So they multiply by weight values and then they summed and then a bias is added and it's run through a threshold function. We don't have to worry too much about that now, but what, what happens is when you train a neural network, you're essentially training the, the weights, you're adjusting the weights. So you have a vast deep learning when you have many layers of these, of these um, neurons and you're running very uh, computationally intense uh, well, mathematical uh, processing by doing this. Well, the math itself is not very complex. As you can see, it's very straightforward math, but it's just doing it a lot on a lot of inputs. So you can up to millions and millions of these nodes at the same time. And then what happens is as the system is running and training those weights update until eventually a uh, set of weights that match um, the data training set and produce the right outputs is found, hopefully. So there's some interesting theory behind that. Um, and it can get quite uh, quite difficult, but again, one doesn't have to know how to drive our car works to drive a car. So, you know, this is also where you have to choose whether you want to go into research and understand the inner work is this, or you will actually be an engineer and do the actual engineering side of it. So, but as you go along, you'll never be touch on both and learn. But one thing for sure, computational complexity increases with uh, moving from classical to deep learning. So quickly going over how do you do this with software? Um, you generally want to do training inference. There are software platforms in many other there's cafe, there's, there's uh, uh, there's obviously PyTorch is quite popular, and TensorFlow, the two ones you see commonly used nowadays. Um, there's Darknet, uh, other funny ones in C for different uh, types of um, applications, but generally TensorFlow, PyTorch, quite, quite commonly used, and TensorFlow probably the de facto, I would say, standard, and is also the basis of the tiny ML movement as well. So this is a software framework which allows you to do training and inference. So it contains the software components that allow you to import data, set up the data, 
run the algorithms, the, the, the choose the algorithms, run them, um, do the training, and then also then take it and deploy it and do inference using an interpreter, which actually then produces the code and runs it for you. Um, quickly going over typical AI um, architectures, machine learning architectures. So back in the beginning 2000s, um, when you when you when we came out of the AI winter, hardware was expensive. Uh, not anybody could afford um, expensive GPUs. Either you had one at home or uh, the big cloud providers, Google in particular, would make these available on the back end um, in the in the in the compute environments. And then you would potentially use uh, GPUs, um, BPUs, or TPUs, um, vision processing units, tensor processing units. So these things would do training and inference in the cloud. And then you would then send um, data out. To, so what you would do is, if you had a machine, you would need to stream the inputs when you're running inference. You would need to stream the inputs in real time from the machine to the cloud, and then do the results and send the results back. So you can imagine if you've got a camera-based system like a robot like that with a camera on that's looking at products on the conveyor line, you would need to stream reasonable quality video at a reasonable frame rate up to the cloud, allow the inference to happen on the GPU or backend, and then stream the results back so you would need quite a high bandwidth connection. And if that connection went down, you'd have problems. Uh, that's your typical cloud AI. That's what most people think of when they think AI. And that's what a lot of people still use. Um, there's also times when you still need to use it anyway. We have no choice, we, you know, which we'll get into later on. Then you've got the more hybrid approach where as um, you have edge processors. So you have a device close to the application running in the field. It's called an edge processor. It's basically a computing unit. It's a... Um, device with a GPU or similar hardware on board, and it's sitting right there close to the application. And you still do the training in the cloud using the big uh, number crunching power that you have available there. Um, but then you run the inference on an edge processor, which is still a decent piece of hardware. And the, you know, it's not a basic uh, microcontroller. It's still something like, it could be a PC with a graphics card in, or it could be a dedicated uh, type of uh, processor. And again, it's expensive, and you still need a decent bandwidth connection between this um, uh, unit and the cloud to, to allow the, 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 the models to be updated and pushed down. And sometimes you find that that um, you might have to offload some of the some of the inference to the cloud still because maybe the thing can't handle it. So that's a hybrid approach. Now we find that with um, with edge AI, you're typically running your inference directly on the edge. Now you'll see I say training and inference because with certain products like Jetson Nano, you can do the training and the inference on the edge as well, which means you could you could literally have a board and you could do a training there and on the field and run the same piece of hardware out to do inference, to build a drone or self-driving car. Um, the edge can be quite a deep subject as well and it's evolved over the years. So typically at the bottom, we start with things. Things communicate with Bluetooth, Zigbee, Thread, LoRa, uh, to an edge gateway, which then communicates via the internet to the cloud. So some things can communicate directly to the internet, which we'll, I'll touch on later on, but generally the traditional approach was we had devices that were short hops from the things to the actual edge gateway, and the edge gateway would then be your back all through to your cloud, and then your cloud would run your backend applications and your analytics, and you'd have your IoT platforms at the back end that uh, users would typically go into. This is generated from industrial, from SCADAs and the likes. So you typically have on the things on the edge would be sensors. Um, they have onboard processing capability and some kind of internet, either direct or indirect, in this case, indirect connectivity. That's where you typically see your embedded systems. You'll see your Arduinos, there's an HDM micro board there. Then you have your edge gateways. Um, these would be um, your more powerful uh, pieces of hardware, like your Raspberry Pi, or there's a dedicated Dell gateway there. There are many devices like this out there, and these would sit somewhere in your application. So if you had a factory, for example, you'd have one edge gateway sitting on the floor, and then out in the factory floor, you'd have all of your sensors and your things talking to the gateway, which then connect via the local um, fiber or data connection out to the cloud, where you'd run your, your, your backend uh, visualizations and analytics and monitoring. Um, they were typically running in a data center uh, off-prem. Then uh, your hardware spectrum, so microprocessor units on the one end, versus microcontrollers. So a lot of people also get a bit thrown off by this. Essentially a microprocessor unit is your traditional computer. So if you go back to the 1990s when we had um, Pentium ones and the like, a microprocessor is when you have your CPU or your processing unit on its own and you have to have a motherboard or additional hardware with it to integrate memory, storage, peripherals. They generally tend to be uh, 
uh, more complicated, but they have a lot more capabilities. For example, you can run an operating system on a microprocessor unit because it contains memory management units and all the, 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 the things required to actually support operating system, whereas on a microcontroller, a microcontroller is more of an embedded device designed for single purpose. It's like a complete computing system in one. So it'll have a very basic CPU, very basic RAM, it'll have basic storage on board and peripherals all in the same chip. So you can think of it like a mini motherboard uh, hard drive. If you think of it like an old computer way of thinking all in one, but very basic, only limited to doing one function. You can't really run uh, Windows or Linux on it. So typically you run bare bone codes. So you'd write your code talking directly to the CPU itself. So it becomes quite, technical and you have to know a bit more. Uh, you, you, you do get real-time operating systems, which are which are sort of like, uh, like threading systems that can run on top of bare bones that allow you to manage tasks a bit better. But again, you need a bit more higher in microcontrollers for that. Your microprocessor will have external memory peripherals. So you'll have your motherboard, you'll have to attach on the motherboard um, your external. But again, that's changing with socks these days, systems on chips where you tend to have it all integrated. But again, um, your, your, your big differentiator is your high power consumption. So it's, a, it's, a, it's more of a computer, application computer than, than, than a microcontroller, which is more dedicated. Your microcontrollers are very low power, milliwatts, under milliwatt, nanowatts in some cases, whereas your microprocessor units will consume watts. Uh, memory will again will be megabytes to gigabytes. So you can run web servers, you can do uh, data storage databases, all kinds of things typically run OS uh, on there, uh, whereas your microcontrollers are memory in kilobytes to megabytes. Multi-core multitasking. So again, you can run operating systems, you can run Docker containers, you can do all kinds of things on, on, on a microprocessor-based system. Single core or dual core in some cases with microcontrollers, like, like the ESP32 will come in dual core. Most of you, although you'll be seeing now, like, like Sony have launched um, this presence, uh, which contains a six core microcontroller and Arduino's got dual core in the Portenta as well. We are seeing more cores appearing and the lines are starting to blur, but still the, the major differentiator would be the ability to run an operating system or not and the amount of memory, the power consumption. Uh, real time, a microprocessor unit is not able to do, you can with some extensions of the Linux do real time, but nowadays um, you'd still prefer to use a microcontroller for that. So typically an example would be using a Raspberry Pi, uh, trying to drive the IO in real time. You, you can't really do it that well, where you could do it on Arduino. Um, GPUs are optional. Um, microcontrollers are lower cost. So this is where Raspberry Pi comes in versus a Arduino. So a lot of people, when they're starting up with embedded, they don't know where to start. So they, they say, what do I use? Oh, I'm gonna build a little uh, light switch with a, with a, with a relay. And they, want, they, they throw a Raspberry Pi because it's overkill where you could use an Arduino. So you, you kind of need to pick your, 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 your platform and decide what you wanna do with it. A lot of things can be done with embedded. The embedded device spectrum is not just an Arduino. That's an example. You get you get you can get boards like this. This, this looks big, but still in a better system. This is a Nordic board. You get um, Arduino also comes typically in more than one form factor. This is the Potenta, this is the Maker, this is the Maker Fox. So you can do a lot of things with these boards, and there's a lot of variety on the market. You're not just limited to one. Um, a good a nice one to play with is the ESP32 cam. So yeah. And Raspberry Pi, they've also launched the Pico as well. So they've also got a, a embedded system. Whereas on, a, on, a, on the other end of the spectrum with your microprocessor unit, your Pi's, you have your Raspberry Pi's. Um, they look, when you look at them, they do look like, like embedded boards, but again, they run cool operating systems. You can see they've got cool HDMI ports, USB, Ethernet, Wi-Fi, all those things. And they, they do have IOs that allow you to, to interface, but not real time. So like if you try to drive, for example, you get a thing called NeoPixel, you can't drive it from Pi because the OS is not fast enough to write to the iOS and embedded system can. This is an interesting one. This is the Jetson Nano. The Jetson Nano is a um, microprocessor-based system. Uh, it's a single board computer as well. I forgot to mention, we refer to these microprocessor-based units as single board computers. They contain everything in, in the system on a chip. Uh, this one contains a... Tensor, Tensor Core um, Maxwell, the GPU, um, um, a, 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 a GPU type uh, chip that is able to execute neural network uh, inference and training. So this one you could actually do training and inference on, and it's quite a powerful little board. It's it's it's, it's probably quite useful. So it's a spectrum of devices. So 
winning that, try to start with an embedded platform like the Arduino C. And if you're not coming right, then move to a single board computer. Typically, you, you use them together in a lot of applications. There are many commercial applications which make use of combinations. So yeah, cost, complexity, power increases as you go towards. This, this is a very broad subject. I'm just hashing over it, but we could spend a lot of time on this. So things, what are things? So we, we talk about the Internet of Things. So the Internet of Things is when you have um, microcontrollers, um, embedded systems with processing, uh, local memory, you can write your own code on it, and you interface into sensors, and you have actuators in some cases as well. And it has to have some kind of communication interface that can allow you to communicate to the internet, like I showed you earlier to the cloud backend or, or to your application running somewhere. And you embed this in a physical object, and this object then becomes a connected thing. So an example is you could take a chair and you could put a microcontroller with a pressure sensor on it. You take when you're sitting down, like you like you're having cars when you're sitting in a car seat belt alert tells you when you're sitting in the seat. Um, and you could have um, inertial measurement unit, and you could have temperature sensor, and you could tell when somebody's actually sitting on the car, are measuring these things and communicating with the internet, and that, that chair would then become a thing, a connected object, a smart object. Um, we talk about the Internet of Things, where um, we turn basically, uh, we have a whole bunch of these things all talking to the internet, uh, to each other, and to, or to the back end on the, more to the back end on the internet, not to each other, actually. Um, you are talking to an application, so you'd have like a IT platform, a scalar platform, or analytics platform on the back end, and instead of having people connected to a computer driving the internet, you have these autonomous things, these embedded systems talking on their own, doing their own thing, talking to the internet. So typically you would, in the old days, you would interface via an edge gateway, especially if you're using things like Bluetooth, Zigbee or LoRa. But uh, over the years, um, a lot of people have decided to cut out the edge gateway and communicate directly. So typically if you use Sigfox, for example, like this, this thing can communicate directly to um, your application backend, like in Amazon um, or AWS uh, using Sigfox, or you could just use normal cellular. There's a lot of options out there now with cellular. And Wi-Fi, if you're on-prem, you can talk via Wi-Fi to your local router and at So your router sort of acts like a gateway, but you're typically passing straight through and talking to the internet. So yeah. And now this is where it gets interesting. So now if you take machine learning and you put machine learning inference on those things. So remember I said those things are sitting there, doing things, measuring things, sending data on. In the past, they were just passively collecting data. Sometimes you were sending commands back to actuate, like open a gate or close a gate. But now you can actually add intelligence to those things. So you can actually say to those things, you know what, now you can react to um, undefined use cases. Like again, sitting on a chair, uh, you would program traditionally a thing to understand the pressure level. You have to work out the average range of pressures from different people sitting on the chairs and put in your normal logic and use some if then logic to say, if it's greater than this range or less than this range, it's probably a person sitting. But then you get somebody that's light or out of range or they're carrying something on their back while they're sitting down in the chair can't pick it up that's where you can then apply machine learning and build a more sophisticated algorithm that can detect variation and generalize and say okay this could be a person sitting on the chair yes it is and i haven't seen this this particular range of values coming in before but i know from my training that these types of inputs in combination with maybe the accelerometer data of how it's moving and the temperature change, it definitely means it's a person sitting. So for example, you could pick up whether an inanimate object or a person was placed on the chair. So if you add a temperature reading combined with pressure, if it's warm and it's a person, warm obviously, and it's, it's pressure, you, you could then work out it's a person. Whereas if it was a box, empty box or a box with a weight in it, you could then tell. So that adds a lot more flexibility to your, uh, um, your edge applications and your IT applications. And essentially, when you combine AI and IoT, they call it the artificial intelligence of things, AIT. And that's essentially what Tiny ML is. Tiny ML is all about uh, doing this and finding optimal ways to squeeze out uh, the hardware on the embedded systems so that you don't need to invest in um, something like this to run on. And this uses a lot of power. This uses tens of watts. When you can run something, you can run a machine learning model on early watts or something like this, and it can run on a battery for a long time. That's essentially what you want to do. So inference you're on the edge. So introducing tiny ML. So I think this is the point where we bring it together. So a lot of information I've shared and I've gone through it quite quickly due to time. But um, tiny ML is the field of machine learning technology. So it's algorithms, techniques, technologies um, perform machine learning and analytics on the edge, 
on your actual uh, low power microcontroller. So it's all about running your, your inference in the milliwatt range, ideally sub one milliwatt. So imagine a sensor out in the field on a battery running for a year or two on a solar panel running almost indefinitely uh, doing uh, machine learning inference without needing any maintenance. And if it's very powerful. Um, Power is important because you know you, you want portable applications. You want to minimize battery usage. You want you, you want you also want to be green and save power. But uh, you want to limit limited memory and processing power is key because on, on embedded systems you want kilobytes of memory. So tiny emails about finding ways to get those deep learning models and those neural networks and those machine learning models to run in constrained environments. So there's some magic behind it. It's not really magic. It's a science and art. But uh, that's the, the, what it's all about. It's an evolving field. And again, imagine spending $100 on something versus spending $1 on something if you were to have it done in the field. That's the benefits. So in the past, you'd have this kind of legacy infrastructure with tiny email. You say bye-bye to that stack, and you can run your inference directly on the cloud, on, on the device. You still, can, you still often use the cloud for training. That's a one-time job, and then you can push it down to your device and run. Again, you could use something like a Jetson and do some training within the limits of the jets and locally as well. Um, but yeah, it's a deep field um, uh, and you know, there's a lot of things you could do with it. So um, moving on, um, yeah, in machine intelligence next to the physical world. So that's what tiny is about. So it's about bringing the machine intelligence right there to the actual physical world. Um, and how is this possible? Well, a lot of work has been done behind the scenes by various researchers, by the guys, TensorFlow micro team, uh, like uh, micro, and of course, uh, edge impulse to actually get this um, uh, ways to do this. And they, they, you know, you, it's, it's, there's a lot of model pruning, uh, compression, all kinds of things that happen down this. It's actually quite amazing to think that you can run a neural network on a small device like that. What are the benefits? Well, I mentioned low power. So again, you're targeting battery powered portable applications, connectivity. You don't need internet connectivity to run inference. You don't need to send your data up to the cloud. You can run vision algorithms. You can detect people in the scene. You can detect vehicles in the scene. You don't need to uh, communicate with anything. You don't need data connection. It saves you power. It saves you cost. Also, rural areas where you don't have data, it's useful. Connectivity. Cost, uh, hardware, cheap hardware. You don't need expensive hardware. Uh, privacy, because you're not sharing data up to the cloud and no one can access your data. Hackers can't hack into your device so easily. Uh, so, yeah, unless you, 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 you are allowing that, uh, but again, you typically be streaming the results out somewhere, but privacy is important because we live in an area where people don't want the sensor data even to be made public because there could be some sensitive information for whatever reason. So latency is important too, because when you're communicating across the internet to the cloud and doing inference in the cloud, you typically have that lag of the result coming back. Now you don't have that, it happens immediately at the point of execution. So that's the benefit. So use cases, there are many, I've just, Come up with a few healthcare, agriculture, industrial, retail, transport. Those are often some of the verticals you see mentioned in a lot of IoT and a lot of tech use cases. Um, healthcare, I'm not going to go into detail, but you can imagine for yourself disease detection. You could use computer vision to detect lung cancer in x rays. You could detect when someone's about to have a heart attack with um, uh, biometric uh, analyzing uh, vitals, heart uh, uh, oximetry for COVID, things like that, sleep disorders. Um, Agriculture, soil condition, adaptive lighting for plant growth, predicting when crops are going to fail, um, industrial predictive maintenance, that's a big one, predicting when machines are going to fail before they fail, so that you can have a technician go out and replace a component on time before it fails, otherwise you don't, you don't have to worry about downtime, which is a big problem in industrial uh, spaces. Smart sensors, um, smart manufacturing process control, you can adaptively adjust your recipes and your processes without needing to have a specialist around. And something goes wrong. Retail automated checkout, smart mirrors, loss prevention, detecting movement patterns in stores when people are about to steal things. Transport, self-driving vehicles, we all know about that. Tool optimization, um, this is something where your control systems in your cars, your ECUs, currently have a very old way of doing it, but in the future they'll start using this tiny ML type technology to optimize your fuel usage in your maps in real time to get the most optimal usage based on your environmental parameters at that time. Um, computer vision, Again, detecting images uh, from images, detecting objects and people and rec recognizing different uh, scenes. Safety and security, again, it relates to vision, detecting patterns of behavior, autonomous robots. This can go on voice recognition. We're all familiar with uh, OK Google or Acery. 
Um, those are actually for the earliest forms of tiny ML. Those were actual DSPs running on your in your phone, performing at one task, listening to OK Google, for example. Um, building management and automation, and many, many more. So yeah, you could you could definitely research this to death and we could go on for hours about this. And then yeah, so quickly an application scenario um, before I move on, almost done. Senses uh, are the senses of a machine. So like we have touch, taste, uh, smell, sight, etc. Machines use sensors, sensors to actually perceive the world. Uh, it goes back to the whole notion of physical computing. We're not doing this sort of that. So we have motion, sound, sight, environmental, and those different types of sensors that, that allow the machine to input that information from the environment. So typically, again, a self-driving car, the old way of doing it would be um, running your inference on, on the edge and communicating when required up to the cloud for maybe supplementary inference and for training new data and sending it down. With tiny ML, you can have dedicated uh, little um, embedded systems, each one doing one particular inference, dedicated to one particular task, and then getting them all to communicate, perhaps in the mesh network with each other. Um, again, you're going from multi-purpose, general purpose computing to uh, microcontrollers. I call it tiny ML fan out, where you can take an application where you be running a lot of um, parallel um, inferences on one big piece of hardware, you can break it up into smaller dedicated, because embedded systems are designed to be dedicated for one specific task. So having each one doing its own little inference also then leverages the ability to optimize the usage of the hardware as well. So yeah, Tiny ML movement, Tiny ML is a nonprofit foundation as well. Uh, it's just, it's not just a approach, it's actually the name of a foundation which drives the Tiny ML and runs these talks. Um, it's all about bringing together diverse community, people from different backgrounds to learn, understand, non-discriminatory, very important, multidisciplinary as well. So it's, a, it's, yeah, it's open and transparent. So it's, it's a new way of thinking, it's a way of bringing everybody together uh, you don't have to be a machine learning expert. You don't have to be a deep science, deep data science expert. You don't have to be embedded systems expert. You don't have to be electronics expert. Just bringing people together from any background, artists, creators, makers, everybody. And that's what's cool about it because often if you're not from a discipline, you feel left out and you feel a bit scared to come in. Tiny is about breaking down that way of thinking and saying, come everybody, let's do this together. Let's, 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 let's learn together. And there's academic involvement as well. Um, there's summits, there's Tiny ML for Good, looking at how this technology can be used to benefit society, the vision challenge, the talks, and of course, meetup groups like this, like when we saw in Cape Town. It was all started probably by the book Tiny ML. Um, this book is a good resource. Um, I recommend it to anybody who wants to get started out, even if you use it just to learn machine learning in general. It's a good way of learning machine learning in general. And yeah, it's becoming a key philosophy. So when you look at the old definitions of the, of the fourth industrial revolution, you often see. Um, Artificial intelligence. I think Tiny ML is going to add on to as the as the next iteration of this where we're heading. It's bringing it. So yeah. So moving on quickly. Um, I'm not going to talk about this too much because you're running short of time. Edge impulse demo. Um, the so what I want to do is when you typically your machine learning process involves all these steps. When you want to solve a problem, you must understand the problem, collect data, prepare the data, train a model, better that. So often you will do this in many different tools. You'll use uh, typically something called Jupyter Notebooks. Colab on Google is what a lot of people use for getting started. There's many other ways you could do it. You could use um, SageMaker and Amazon as well, um, AWS. But again, it's, it's, it's laborious. It's, it's like DevOps, but they call it MLOps. Uh, it, it, it takes a lot of time. You spend more time fighting with the data, writing code, understanding how the platform works. It can be quite daunting, but I do recommend learning to try and do something this way because then it gives you an appreciation for what something like Edge Impulse brings. Edge Impulse gives you everything in one space. It gives you a platform with a studio um, where you can literally collect your data, um, extract your features, prepare your data, um, train it, split your data to training and test sets, retrain, validate your models and deploy as well. So it's, it's really cool. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to quickly show something with Edge Impulse. Um, we're running very short time. I'm gonna try and be quick about this as well. So yeah, so I'll just stop sharing now. All right, change over. Okay, so I'm just going to share my web page. Um, so typically, when you when you go into um, <clears throat> when you <clears throat> when you start with Edge Impulse, you create an account, you log in, and I'm going to quickly show you an application I put together for this. The application I have is basically taking a phone, a mobile device, 
and put it into a box. And imagine you imagine you are shipping something and you want to see if there's damage to the item. So building a little a model that quickly um, using your phone. I'm not going to use an embedded system because it's accessible to anybody using a phone. Nice thing about uh, edge impulse is that you can get started with your phone. If you don't have an embedded dev kit, you can experiment with your phone. So what I, what I thought about is I'd like something where I could put the phone in the box and then I could say, has the box been shake, shook up in any way or has it actually fallen on the ground? And we were able to detect it. So going into to start out with something like this, you create a new project. So I'll just do a tiny. Create a new project. So I create a project. And then um, once you are in the project, um, in this case, because we're going to use um, accelerate motion, we're gonna, I'm choosing accelerometer data. And yeah, I'm going to say, right, let's get started. So next step data acquisition. So our devices, I'll use a phone. So you can select. So here, if you have development kits, you can choose your options. In my case, I'm using the phone. So what do you do is you typically use um, QR code app on your phone. You scan the barcode. Okay, there we go. And then once you've paired it up, because I'm using the phone, it's a bit different to how you would normally use a dev kit. But um, you'll see your phone is paired up there. And then you can actually start acquiring data. So what I'll do is I'm just going to switch to the phone view quickly. So if you look here, I'm just going to change screens quickly. So I'm sure you can see the phone view. Um, now you can see I'm live on my phone here. So I'm going to say click motion. And then you can actually choose the so I have a label, and I have a label for um, call it up down. I'm going to choose a 10 second uh, capture, and then I'm going to start recording. And then I can actually move the phone up and down and collect it like You typically go through this kind of um, process to collect data. I'm not going to do it now because you can collect a decent amount of data. But what I'm going to show you is how, when you collect the data, um, how we, once you see what I've collected data. So there's one sample. I'm going to collect another sample. You'll see it'll pop up in studio. It'll pop up here as soon as it's done. Okay. There we go. So you see, there's the data collected. And what's nice about the Edge Impulse Studio is you can actually see the data. There's your raw accelerometer data. So what you do is you'd actually take this data and you would actually then um, generate features on it. Um, and you'd actually build, okay. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna close this project quickly and just go to the completed project just to show you guys the final concept here. So what you do is you, once you've collected your data, so here you'll see I've collected a lot of samples and I've collected under different labels. I've labeled it still. Um, and these, these, um, these will be up, down, they will be sideways, different, different uh, and drop, so I've dropped, dropped the device. Then you would go to your um, impulse design. And again, again doing this, there are values you can follow. I'm going very fast this time. I haven't got time to actually get on the scratch. But essentially, once you've clicked your data, you will just see this block here, where you can adjust um, the window size, which is how much uh, time slices of the data it actually uses, and, and the sliding window, which it increases by. And then what you do is you typically generate features. So when you when you um, create features, uh, when you train a neural network, uh, it's better to train it on the features, not the raw data. So you extract first the features that make most sense to train on, and will give you the best possible results as opposed to raw data. So this is typically where I mentioned unsupervised learning, dimensionality reduction, clustering, those kind of things coming to help you understand the data. So when you when you look at your features, um, what I've done here is um, I've generated features already. If you look on the right here, you have the features that were generated previously. So what this shows, this actually shows how nicely the data separates. So all the data points that represented um, the sideways motion all clustered together nicely. All the drop ones are clustered together and the up down are also sort of clustered. Now what you'll see interestingly enough here is up down and drop, they overlap 
because if you drop something, there's a, there's a motion, downward motion before it hits the ground. So that type of motion will be picked up in this. Okay, I've just regenerated the feet while I was talking to you. It will come out the same again. That type of motion will then get picked up and create a little bit of, um, I wouldn't say confusion, but uh, overlap. So you would get cases where up-down motion might be falsely classified as drop. So ideally, when you train or you and you gather data and you generate features, you want to try and create uh, a feature map like this that actually a feature that is separated as best as possible. So I would typically need to go and actually recapture up-down data and see why. And I know why this happened. This happened because when I was doing the drop, I was picking the, picking the box up and dropping it uh, every time. So that picking up the box and dropping it um, was causing me to create an up-down type uh, pattern as well. So typically you'd rather want to take your time and drop the box and then wait and drop and then just get this kind of data here, which is what I did halfway through the process. I stopped dropping the box, uh, picking it up. I dropped it and waited till the, the, the time at window of capturing was done and picked it up and then dropped it again. So yeah, but what's interesting in life is when you run this um, on your um, device, so that's the last thing I want to do. I'm just going to run it quickly. I'm just going to, uh, what you, okay, what you do is you, you you would train before initial training. Once you're done with the, with the, um, with that process, you would click start training, you train your model, and then uh, when you've, you could retrain if, you, if you're not happy, or you could you can also run it, if you're an embedded system, you can run it live, but because I'm using the phone, it doesn't work like this, you actually do directly for the phone, so I'll show you. You can also deploy it if you have a dev kit. You can actually take the same model, train on the phone, and deploy it to a dev kit. What I'm gonna do now is, um, I'm going to just quickly show you the model running live, and we're done. Um, But it's in the time it's taken me to actually speak about doing it. If I have the data captured, I could have done all that in this time already. So pretty fast. Okay. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to push the classification mode. This is achieving the project. Okay. So what happened is yeah, I made a mistake here. Yeah. Okay, what happens? I didn't I, I changed the features by mistake. I should have done that. What will happen is typically um I'm just training it quickly. Um it takes a few minutes to train. What you would see here is you'd actually see a live view where you can actually drop it. I don't know if 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 um Bobby wants to maybe talk quickly while I just train it. And if anybody wants to see, I'll just show it on me. It's gonna take about five minutes uh, training. Well, we actually have a few questions. We can probably take some of the questions while we uh, wait for that. Okay. Uh, one is uh, there are very many tiny ML boards online. Is there one which is strongly recommended? Well, okay, I'm again. I'm not the expert in this, but I would I would recommend Arduino. The Arduino Potenta is a good one. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, basically, anything with Arduino, any any other Arduino products are quite good. Sony is presence also a very good product as well. Uh, very powerful. Um, yeah, I, I would recommend starting up with something like this. It's a H7 vision. You get this board with a camera attached to it. It's quite a nice, it's quite a powerful board as well. And it's it's a lot more powerful than some of the other ones out there. You can use this as well, but there's no sensors on this thing. Another board actually, I would really recommend. Sorry, what was the other board that you showed? I'm sorry, the Pico. The problem with the Pico. Pico is it doesn't have any sensors attached, so you're going to have to build all your things on yourself. What I, would, what I would recommend instead, though, actually, is this one. It's the Thunderboard Sense. It's quite a cheap mm -hmm. device. And this contains a light sensor, a pressure sensor, a microphone, um, accelerometer, and you can do a lot with this. Actually, you can do a lot, and it's directly supported in studio. So in studio, you can actually um, you can actually uh, deploy directly to the board and actually play with it while you're actually doing it. So yeah, I would recommend this one if you want to get started quickly. Underboard sense. You can get them online. Um, you can search for it. Um, I'm switching to classification mode quickly. And that's better yeah, to rebuild the project because I, I, I actually generated the features while I was talking. But it's not playing nicely with me today. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, one question is about, do you generally recommend collecting and deploying data on the same device uh, that you're going to deploy for inference? That's a very good question. Um, yes, you, 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 when you collect data, what I picked up is that um, obviously you've got different microphones, different sensors, um, different... As long as your data is normalized properly, and this is where Edge Impulse helps you as well to actually um, analyze data and see where it's coming from. So, okay, if you're not if you're not using a board that is Edge Impulse has an SDK which you dig into the examples, you can actually see some of the code there. 
And you could actually, if you that way inclined, you could actually try and create your own um, customization for your own boards. But our, if you use other supported boards, then the SDK has basically normalized the ledger for you already. So if you use any of the supported boards, then you would uh, be sure to that you won't have problems with moving a model from one board to another. So I've played with a board, model on a Thunderboard Sense and I've moved it to, um, um, what, I actually moved from a phone to Thunderboard Sense and it actually worked fine. Um, interestingly enough. So, so, you know, you, oh, so I would say with the studio and using supported boards, it's a lot easier to work between. If you're going to do customizations, then obviously it's a bit more work involved. If you're going to, use, if you're going to build your own, if you're going to take yeah. something like this and build your own microphone onto it. But that's why I always say don't waste time, stand on the shoulder of giants. If you're going to build something, buy something with a hobby really integrated because it can end up taking you a lot more time to actually build and design and even on a breadboard, wire up microphones and getting it right. Just buy something with a with all your essences on board already and off you go. Got it, got it. All right, uh, in the interest of time, I know there are a few more questions and we'll continue the conversation on the TinyML forums. This is tinyml.org slash forums. So if you can just go back to your slides, we can uh, just... Yeah. Uh, there is the demo gods on my side there, but essentially what will happen is the, the, you would see when you're running live, um, it actually works quite well. You'll actually, I've made the, the thing public as well, the project, so you can, you can share it as well. And you could actually see when you drop the box, it picks up the box dropping, it picks up standing still, it picks up motion. And it took me half an hour from thinking of the idea to actually having it working. And then, yeah, that's it. So last slide from me um, is, um, you know, Edge Impulse have got the Eon compiler. That's part of the magic we added. I would say exploring further, get the tiny email book. Um, the sample chapters online, I think the first six sample chapters are online to get you going. But really get the full book. And check out uh, the Imagine, um, Edge Impulse is having an Imagine conference next week. That's going to be really cool and really awesome. And that's it from me. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you very much for a great introductory talk. I, I think it was really good. Sorry about the demo. I know live demos are a little tricky sometimes, but that's okay. Uh, yeah, and uh, for everybody in the audience, you'll have a five question poll that pops up. Please do answer that. And uh, please continue the conversation at tinyml.org slash forums. Peter can provide the link to the uh, uh, GitHub page and everything to the project, to the public project as yeah. needed. I'll post it on the forums, yes. And like I said, I'm not an expert, but you ask me, you can ask me anything you want, but I'll try to help you where I can, so. Yep, that's why we have the forum, so everybody can pitch in and answer. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Um, we'd like to thank again our DynaML Talk sponsors and strategic partners. Aon Devices, Arm, Deep Light, Edge Impulse, Emza Visual Sense, Greenwaves Technologies, Latent AI, HOTG, ImageBob, Maxim Integrated, Kixo, Qualcomm, Reality AI, Seed Studio, Sensimal, Sensense, and Sentient. Additional sponsorships are available. Please contact olga.tinyml.org for more info. ARM, Architecting a Smarter World, Powering Innovation Through AI. DeepLight, uses AI to make other AI faster, smaller, and more power efficient. Edge Impulse enables developers to create the next generation of intelligent device solutions with embedded machine learning. Emza Visual Sense, Emza, the I in IoT, enables Edge AI through ultra low power visual sensors. Greenwaves Technologies, enabling the next generation of sensor and hearable products to process rich data with energy efficiency. HOTG, building the distributed infrastructure to pave the way for AI enabled edge applications. Latent AI, adaptive AI for the intelligent edge. Maxim Integrated, the new Max 78000 implements AI inferences at low energy levels. Now the edge can see and hear like never before. Kixo, automated machine learning platform that builds tiny mill solutions for the edge using sensor data. Qualcomm, advancing AI research to make efficient AI ubiquitous. Reality AI with pre-built edge AI sensing modules plus tools to build your own. Sensimal, pioneering TinyML software tools that auto-generate AI code for the intelligent edge. Sinsense builds ultra low power sensing and inference hardware for embedded mobile and edge devices. And 
sentient moving artificial intelligence and machine learning from the cloud to the edge devices. This is a reminder again for our next animal talk coming up on Tuesday. And uh, I'd like to thank um, Peter again uh, for this inaugural Cape Town, South Africa meetup talk. I, I think it was very, uh, very informative. And just a reminder for everyone, the YouTube video, the video will be recorded and available on our YouTube channel by tomorrow and the slides will be available on our forums. Please check out tinyml.org slash forums. Thank you again, Peter. Pleasure, thank you.